So how do you guys like uh, the San Luis Resort? <laughs> you know, El Elvin wanted the Motel 6 down the street, but he said, you know, social workers aren't used to any kind of elegance. <laughs> but then we did hear that at least one of them was very interested in going to a place with a swim up bar. So we won't mention any names, but I think you know who it is. Um, and if not, we'll tell you later. The, um, this, is, this is a great venue. It's actually uh, one of the many that is, uh, is actually owned by one of, one of our regents at the uh, university. And, and very, um, uh, we're, we're very fortunate that, that uh, uh, the city of Galveston is also very supportive of our academic programs and some of the things that we've done. Um, I've had a chance to be down here a couple times. Um, Alvin has, has been here on three or four occasions, you know, having to stay here just to make sure it was up to par for the conference. Uh, I think he made a good choice. What do you think? You know, we, we thank uh, Texas State uh, San Marcos and uh, Dancy and Dr. Nancy Afeo uh, Shafkin. Is she here? the director for the Center for Children and Families, and also Dr. Karen Brown uh, for their vision and presentation for 14 years uh, of this roundtable. And the responsibility for organizing the roundtable has, has uh, been transferred or shifted to uh, UHD and the uh, Center for Family Strengths. And we know it's a, it's a heavy mantle to carry, and especially after the many years of successful organizing that they've done. So first, to thank them. And, and if they're here, we thank you. If, if, if they're not, is, is any, somebody yeah, here? Nancy's here? Nancy, will you stand up? Well, she was. She, I guess she's not here. OK. <laughs> he, he, he has trouble seeing. <laughs> you notice he's, he's, got, he's got his glasses on. Anyway. Um, the uh, let me let me talk a little bit since most of you do not know about the University of Houston system or the University of Houston downtown. The University of Houston system, main campus, the University of Houston, um, has a doctoral program, has has football teams such as the Cougars, etc. The University of Houston downtown is part of that system, separate university, uh, and we are. Um, like the University of, like say uh, UT Austin also has UT Brownsville and UT San Antonio, et cetera, et cetera. Well, we are a separate university. The difference is we're five miles from, from um, the University of Houston's main campus. We offer different kinds of programs and we're very happy that we are now offering uh, a bachelor's of social work. And I think that's, that's a major contribution to the city of Houston and of what we, and it's very consistent with our mission. The University of Houston downtown is, even though if you've never heard of it, it's the second largest university in Houston, 13th largest in the state of Texas, public university. Also, we have received a national recognition uh, this year, for example, we were selected uh, as one of the universities on the, on the President's honor, honor Roll for, uh, for, for public service and community engagement. Uh, we, have, we are in the top 100 universities, of 4,800 universities in the country that are, that are uh, evaluated on uh, the, the graduation of minority students in the STEM fields. And, and most of those universities have a full degree, uh, engineering school. We do not. We're in the top 50 in the graduation of African American students. Uh, we're number uh, 34 in the graduation of Hispanic students in the, in the entire country. Now, we're also a very diverse institution, and unlike a lot of universities that sit in urban centers, we look very much like our, the university that we're a part of. 
Uh, we are, Houston is a majority minority city and we are a majority minority campus. 38% um, of our students are, are uh, Hispanic, 29% are African American, 22% white, 10% Asian, a lot of international students. And I, we, the ceremony for graduation that we just did, 91 countries were represented in the graduating class. Average age of our students is just under 30. Most work 30 hours or more. Uh, most travel uh, up over 40 miles uh, to come to the university to take their classes. And, and 80%, as I said, work 30 hours or more. A full 15% uh, uh, work uh, more than 40 hours a week, but they often work two jobs. So these are, are, for the most part, working adults. We do get 17 and 18-year-olds just come right out of high school. But for the most part, we get working adults. And they bring with them the kinds of problems that working adults face, but also experiences. And we have students in foster care who've aged out. We've had students who've been abused. We have homeless students. Uh, we have, for example, two homeless students who, are, who uh, through the Grace Foundation, uh, will, will be uh, starting in the fall with, with some scholarships that we are matching. We have a student uh, that, that takes the bus from a homeless shelter every day to UHD to take uh, classes, uh, take her classes. Um, but as a consequence, because we're a very engaged university, we work with these problems every day. You cannot, where we're located is in the heart of the downtown. It's on the edge of the bayou. There are homeless living in the bayou underneath the bridge that walks to where our university is. We see them every day. The jail is literally, you can throw a stone and hit it. So when people are released, they're released to the bus stop right down the street from our university. Uh, sh the problems that are the problems of any major city, we confront every day, as do our students. And our faculty are aware of it. Houston is not, it's a great city. It's an expanding city. It's the fourth largest city in the state. You know, it has the most square foot, you wouldn't think of it, in terms of green uh, buildings, in terms of lead platinum buildings, the more square footage of any city in the country. I would never have said that. You know, the, the fourth largest uh, port in the world, right here at Galveston, uh, Houston, second largest in the country. Houston is an, a, an amazing city and it is thriving. It'll bypass Chicago in just the next decade. As it's doing that though, you're also, it's also a very, a city of polarities, of rich and of poor. And you don't have, I drive my bikes often with Elvin. Uh, we will ride through some of the communities. And we're fortunate because there are our bike paths, also, although some of them are painted bike paths, <laughs> and you, you take your life in your hands when you go there. But as you do, you see that polarity. You don't have to go four miles from the downtown before you see uh, shotgun houses that, that are the old segregated African-American Hispanic wards it still exist today. So our, our students grow up in these communities with these experiences. Our faculty deal with them. We teach about them. So naturally, social work, even though we're just starting this and hopefully we'll get accredited this year, it's something close to our heart. You know, in many respects, um, as, as I said, we're, we're very fortunate to have uh, to participate in this conference. We're learning a lot about it. Uh, for, we're very fortunate to have um, Elvin to join us as the uh, 
as a visiting professor and, uh, and, and also to establish the Center for Family Strengths that with all the heritage and history uh, that, that have come from previous conferences and from the, and the family preservation movement over many years. You know, you, you, there's, there's an old saying that you tell a lot about a person by their friends. And I'm fortunate not only to have Elvin as a friend, but our university to have you as friends. And let me add that. The students, the families, the homeless, the poor, the abused, those who face domestic violence, those who are dealing with, with behavioral uh, issues, behavioral health issues, they have your programs as a friend. And we are here to ensure that those programs are strong, vibrant, and, and, and are doing the best in terms of, of not only theory, but, but uh, practice-based um, procedures. We wish you the best in terms of this conference. I know it's gonna be a great success. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, President Flores. Aren't we lucky at UHD? How many of us would love to have a president that understands what social work's about and the kind of struggles we deal with and to support these kind of programs? So thank you again, President Flores, for your leadership and uh, being here with us today. Um, in introducing our keynote speaker, I have one word that I want to begin with, relationship. Uh, research shows that relationship is the essence of the essential work that we do with children and families. Relationship is critical to change, and change is basic to social work. Our relationship involves a number of different groups and people. We have family, we have uh, children and families, we have students, colleagues, friends, policy makers, institutions, and indeed the whole world. Our keynote speaker excels at relationships. And let me just go through these very briefly. When we talk about children and families, she's a mother, she's a sister. Unfortunately, she just lost her sister to cancer. She was willing to come to this conference even though her sister was deathly ill, and I know she was a great support to her sister. Uh, so she certainly knows family. Students, there are doctoral students all over the United States that have benefited from our keynote speakers' work with them. And I'm always amazed, as busy as she is, as engaged as she is in national and state issues, the time she would make for her doctoral students and one included a dissertation on Title IV-E. Uh, colleagues, as a leader of the National Association of Social Workers, the Council on Social Work Education, the National Association of Dean and Directors, our keynote speaker always takes a leadership role in those organizations. As a friend, um, back when I was running a lot of marathons, I had to run every day. It was an addiction, I'll admit it. And whenever I came to a conference where our keynote speaker was, I'd call her and say, you wanna go for a run? And in the early days, believe it or not, I was faster. And as time evolved, she got quicker and quicker, and she worked more and more diligent at it. And a group of us went up to St. George's Marathon in Utah, and I kinda of dropped back as she was running her first marathon, I said, you want me to run with you? She said, no, I'm fine. I've met so-and-so here and developed a relationship with her and we're gonna run this together. I wish that she would have done that with me because she beat me in the marathon. So she is a wonderful friend. She's co-authored a number of books and journals and I've had the pleasure of co-authoring a book with her. And often when you co-author books, you're often not the best of friends. But in this case, we're still close friends. Um, and with policymakers, she has developed relationships. She served as the Assistant Secretary for Children, Youth, and Families 
for the state of Washington. Um, and institutions, she currently serves as the dean of the School of Social Welfare, and she has taken many leadership positions through the years in academia. The world, through the United Nations, in her book on family-centered practice, she uh, participated in the Year of the Family, the Year of the Child, on a worldwide basis. So our keynote speaker has excelled at relationships. As the co-principal investigator for the National Child Welfare Workforce Institute, our keynote speaker has utilized her relationship with eight other institutions in developing leadership capacity and in innovative social work education. She has fostered innovation in all aspects of her life and through these numerous, uh, numerous relationships. She's co-author of the forthcoming book on the Children's Bureau, Shaping a Century of Practice, Program, and Policies. And she serves on the editorial board for the Journal of Family Strengths. There's a call for the papers in your uh, packet. And she suggested today, I think it's a wonderful idea, that we look at a special issue celebrating the century of the Children's Bureau. Uh, Dr. Catherine Breyer Lawson has packed more than a century of wonderful change into the lives, uh, our lives and others, through her relationships. And we're so fortunate for her to come today and share her wisdom, her leadership, and most of all, her vision with us. Please welcome Dr. Catherine Breyer Lawson. Thank you for such kind and very um, unwarranted um, introductions because uh, the honor has been mine through all these years, Alvin, with you. And then to imagine Alvin with this powerhouse president who sounds like he deserves immediately an honorary MSW and BSW <laughs> because he thinks like us and he is so inclusive of all of his students, particularly those with a greatest barriers to come to his fine university. So it's my great honor to be here to both learn with you what some of the next milestones will be for our work in child welfare, as well as to celebrate all that you've done to get this far, and not only to overcome great barriers, as many of us have in the last um, many years, particularly in the most recent economic crisis of the nation, if not globally, but for many to even come here where states or counties or universities have made uh, travel so very difficult. So it's a tribute, Alvin, to you and your team, to your wonderful program, to your center, to your university, to the president's office, to a region who is willing to help give all of us one of the most memorable environments to have this action-packed conference. So my hat's off to you, to all of you. So I'm going to take you on just a quick journey with me in some of the professionalization issues in child welfare. And I'm reminded of the, uh, the early years when I had been appointed as an assistant secretary for the state of Washington. And in 87, crack cocaine had just hit. Uh, there were a lot of child deaths that were engulfing child welfare systems across the country. We thought we had a competency crisis in terms of being capable of predicting um, who was at risk of, uh, of not just abuse and neglect, but, but death because a parent couldn't protect, there were drugs in the family. And to my surprise as an assistant secretary, what we thought was a competency issue was unpacked around the country as a workforce crisis. We had a third vacancy rates in CPS. We couldn't hire and retain sufficient numbers of workers. And so at the time, with NASW, with Jones Lotnick, who was also at NASW, the National Commission on Families, which I had the honor of chairing, and the US Children's Bureau, we began to co-craft what now is called the 4E Roundtable. But it was very much about unpacking the funding streams to go with the exciting visions we had for professionalizing child welfare and solving, at, at that time in 87, 
not just the competency crisis, the workforce crisis. Well, the fact that we keep the workforce on our agenda all these years is a high point of my career because it's not the most interesting issue. You won't find uh, great conferences around the world on workforce. They'll be on child abuse and neglect. They'll be on risk factors for, um, for children he heading into jails. There are so many consequences when the workforce isn't attended to, and you are the legacy for why workforce matters, because you live it every day. And that's why professionally, professionalizing child welfare is a journey that we can never turn our back on, because it's going to be uphill until we've solved some of the basic challenges, some of which I'm going to talk a little bit about today, but hopefully in the next day or two we'll craft together even more solutions. As part of my journey, I've had the most wonderful honor to be, as Alvin said, the co-PI on the National Child Welfare Workforce Institute. Even the fact that we have a National Workforce Institute, a byproduct of a number of universities and the National Indian Child Welfare Association coming together, speaks volumes about all you've done all these years and how important the partnerships are in your 4E work, with your nonprofit agencies, many of whom are now doing the work of public child welfare. These are the partners who came together, and um, most of them, along with my university, had the earlier recruitment and retention grants, which taught us about how to not just select and recruit, but what the retention barriers and issues were. And so it's with the greatest of honor that we have these initiatives through the Institute with multiple leaders across the country making, I think, very strategic, very effective um, outcomes uh, uh, in, for all of us around workforce development. You can see that the purpose is very much about improving outcomes. So it's a workforce for a purpose. If it weren't linked to outcomes for children, youth, and families, we wouldn't really have a reason to celebrate workforce as the centerpiece, as the root issue. We also know that in caring about workforce, the vision is a very high-performing workforce, one that's strengthened by professional education, leadership development, systems of care principles, which I'll talk about in a little while, and much more skilled at delivering effective practices, if not evidence-based practices. And some of these slides will be available to you, so if you're taking notes, just feel like you can do whatever you need to do, but they will be available. We also are committed through the Institute, not just in promoting promises, pra promising practices in workforce development, but in highlighting the missing piece for all of us, which is leadership development. And I'm going to talk some more about that because I think it's the missing piece in our schools and programs of social work. We also oversee baccalaureate and master's level traineeship programs. We have 12 schools of social work, baccalaureate, master's combined programs, overseeing these traineeships that are piloting some of the most innovative work. You'll hear Sharon Kohler tomorrow talk some more about this. We have national peer networks. So as we build this leadership capacity, there are practice communities where our traineeship um, students, our traineeship field instructors, our traineeship faculty and deans can be part of a peer network. Our middle managers, our supervisors in these initiatives can talk with one another in their region and across the country. And we're working on very strategic dissemination and collaboration and evaluation. Our work is very much data-driven with the Butler Institute at Denver. Uh, so all of our formative and evaluative research feeds forward improvements as we go. So you can see that our activities include learning and leading and changing. Now for many of us who know deeply the child welfare system, not just as a change system, but also one that struggles with barriers involving um, traditional rules and bureaucracies and civil service challenges, that to have change, to have leadership, to have learning systems at the forefront is in of itself a very 
creative 21st century vision that the Children's Bureau had for what was needed in our systems across the country. And I don't need to tell you how hard you all are working, we're all working, on improving outcomes, our program improvement plans, as our child and family service reviews guide us, tell us how much more we have to do. So at the center of our work is a view of leadership that is partly crafted through a lot of um, evidence, a lot of knowledge uh, generating activities coming in part from our Butler um, uh, co-leaders at Denver. But you can see for us, leading is not just about good outcomes. It's also about leading in context, building collaboratives. If our families are served by 14 other agencies in our community, then they all need to be part of what it means to be a leader. They all need to be part of the accountability system. It also means that we're leading change with goals, with outcomes, as well as leading for results. And in leading people, we're ultimately concerned about new ways to deputize, to inspire, to empower those where the target of change now is the, the active agent of change. And so you see the pillars below around leadership principles, Heifetz's work on adaptive leadership. We in our schools of social work and our undergraduate programs often don't teach principles of leadership. Adaptive leadership is very different from traditional management, traditional approaches to how one administers a program. It's being inventive every time you see a challenge. It's getting outside of that managerial role to literally be the, the, problem, in, the problem solver visionary, to bring others in a collaborative mode into solving those problems, to distribute leadership by deputizing everyone around you to be part of the solution, to be as inclusive as possible, giving the power away. Again, in bureaucracies, the notion that you would distribute power, that you would deputize perhaps um, frontline staff, parents, foster parents, youth, to be part of the solution, to be driving the guidance for reform, that's still pretty pioneering, pretty new. And then obviously to be outcome focused, another key principle for leadership. All of this suggests that what may be working in some of our national initiatives may need to be part of a self-audit in our schools and programs of social work. Because if we're not teaching this, then we're going to want to get more aligned. You can see that our principles on collaboration are also aligned with systems of care. And if we're not teaching systems of care in our programs, again, we need to look at what it would take for us to get more on board with the system of care practice and principles. My theory is many of the systems of care initiatives that grew out of children's mental health actually sound much more like some of the family preservation and collaboration movements that began in child welfare. But I'll only say that to you, because I dare not uh, let our mental health folks know that, uh, that I think we were um, possibly even uh, creating this before they named what we were doing. Uh, much of our work involves a national advisory committee. Uh, we have a very colla collaborative executive management team since we're learning nationally how to work with you know, eight other schools of social work plus the NICWA, the National Indian Child Welfare Association. And again, sharing the load, sharing the, the, the programming, sharing the outcome charting, sharing all the solutions to barriers. All of our work is done is a cooperative agreement with the US Children's Bureau, because without their visions, this institute wouldn't have been possible. And again, it's really a capstone for all of us, because as workforce has moved to the center stage, we now have the Children's Bureau really elevating your work, our work, collectively. We're deriving not just best practices, but also feeding those into leadership and workforce development identifying leadership competencies, collecting many competency frameworks, curricula, um, and best practices around workforce, identifying resources that would guide our activities. And as we look at the many pillars of leadership, distributive, adaptive, inclusive, 
We're also rolling out over the last three years and another two to come, training across the country for supervisors as well as middle managers. The supervisors have an online, very intensive training, workforce leadership uh, academy, and the middle managers go to a one-week residential, again, very intensive academy. But they all take on leadership projects. They learn to be change leaders. And that stepping outside of their traditional managerial roles and learning how to be much more adaptive and really inspired as they bring their change vision to a workplace that now needs to be helping them roll it out. And then the transfer of training is an issue that we all are challenged by. Every class we teach, are we sure that what we're teaching is actually grounded in what our graduates can use in their agencies? So looking at training transfer is a very major part of our work. As I mentioned, the middle manager training, you can see across the country we've had very successful, very inspiring middle manager training. Although the, the, the only area that I would say we're still learning our way through is in a few cases, some of the visions that our managers have had for their change projects uh, involve um, from time to time a barrier where there may not be funding or there may be a change in their administration where it's not entirely 100% possible for them to roll out their change vision. But that said, what they are doing is so inspiring. And so change leadership is the core of what our training is about. And the same is true for our, uh, our wonderful supervisory online training. You'll also see that the interactive um, learning that's done online is in itself a challenge. You know, how many supervisors have the time to put in 40, 60, many more hours to learn how to be change leaders around workforce, around their own workforce development vision. So we are learning not just the barriers, but how to help them overcome these barriers with high-tech supports. Now, part of our work is the traineeships, which you're going to hear more about tomorrow from Sharon, where each traineeship site, and many of them are several universities coming together, are hubs of innovation, hubs much more on how you retain how a university and school or program supports graduates long after they've graduated, so there are alumni groups, uh, ensuring that as a dean and director, every child welfare graduate is somebody I care about the way President Flores cares about that homeless student who's enrolled in his university. That's the connectedness that we often have not had, but is part of what we're seeing in our traineeships. We're also seeing not just information sharing, dissemination of best practices nationally, uh, but also some very cool use of peer networks, which again, Sharon is leading. And those peer networks are practice communities who communicate online. They communicate through teleconferences, through webinars. And they become very much part of a, a consultation and resource exchange far beyond any formal training that they might be getting. So you can see us now in this learning community that's change-focused, that's very inspired by the, the visions of our, quote, trainees, students, as well as middle managers, supervisors. And we're looking forward now, as we move forward, to the capstone um, initiatives that are coming out of all these um, sub-projects, to being able to say a whole lot more about what the 21st century workforce leadership competencies, outcomes, best practices, and evidence will look like. Now, our work is grounded not just as a Children's Bureau cooperative agreement. We are embedded in the Technical Assistance Network with the National Resource Centers. We are not a traditional National Resource Center in that we have very specific deliverables, so we don't do consultation as many states and counties and others enjoy with the traditional resource centers, but we do work very hard in dissemination. And again, I'm so pleased that Sharon's here. And would you just wave your hands so people can find you? Because she is also a, a leader, not just around peer networks, but also around some of the outcomes. And as we, we look to the future, our models are um, collaboration-driven, 
but very much a byproduct of the excellence of each of our partners. And at the end of the day, we're all about mirroring systems of care principles. Again, those are best practice principles that have driven the development of excellence in child welfare. And so as I return to those principles in the context of workforce development in a few minutes, I'm going to take my NICWI uh, co-PI co hat off and kind of take you through my visions for what our high-performing credentialed workforce should be looking like. My dream would be that we'd be graduating um, very culturally competent, evidence-informed uh, leaders who are so um, competency-driven that credentials are easy to come by because they are um, they have the stamp of the highest gold standard in social work education and practice. And our work is not just for today, but also for creating tomorrow's systems, service delivery systems, as well as workforce development systems. And I'm going to put the two together in just a minute. I also see us benchmarking our success for collective effectiveness. And we have some good examples of workforce studies. I think you'll be hearing from Patrick and Cheryl and Bert and others about how we go beyond our own 4E partnership, how we think about the state of the workforce throughout our state, and include, in many cases, the nonprofits that are themselves delivering state and county level uh, social services for child welfare families that we're committed to very high levels of retention, high levels of satisfaction, and the highest pay, because the work we do in child welfare involves some of the most complex, the most challenging, and in my estimation, the most inspiring social work there is. And we continue to focus on leadership, because it takes a leader to do some of the most um, barrier-busting work for the most high-need families and children uh, in our profession. Many of our practice challenges involve the fact that the roles that some of our graduates take are not always fully utilizing their social work skills and knowledge. And I'm going to return to that in a minute because I think that's an opportunity. And that in many cases we see um, systems not just professionalizing but reversing their commitment to hiring uh, trained social workers. Uh, saying, we, you know, you, you're not generating enough. Although we heard this morning that at least in one state, it might be Louisiana, where um, any new hire has got to be a 4E graduate. So that gives us, if you will, almost an experimental design to see what the differential impact of that cohort of, of um, uh, hirees might be compared to prior hiring, which may be a mixed workforce. In states, and I'm going to speak both for uh, my time in Ohio and New York, we have some counties where there are frontline workers who have no college degree. We have some counties that have never seen an MSW or a BSW, not just in child welfare, in any public social service system, in, in welfare or any related juvenile justice delivery system. Imagine. They couldn't even know what they don't know because they'd never seen what a social worker could do with high-need families. We also know that our workforce turnover in some areas prior to this economic recession was up to 75%. It was epidemic. And then the cost of each person leaving is a minimum of 50000 per worker. So if we were to look at how much money we would be saving that could go into a workforce development campaign, if you would, or workforce studies, that the money could be saved by virtue of more workforce improvements and investments. And we know that um, APHSA has argued earlier on that 60% of turnover is preventable that this is really within our reach to change. And many of you are the solution. Now, historically, you know that in the 50s, and some of us were part of an earlier cohort called into public child welfare, income maintenance work, where the two were connected, that, that we were in trained social work workforces, that deprofessionalization is a byproduct of the 60s. I mentioned some of the early work in the late 80s, 1980s for the Children's Bureau, 
And today, we have fewer than 30% who are BSWs and MSWs in child welfare across the country. Now, many of you have helped to even that out, so you've got much more intensive um, um, penetration rates. We know that with Title IV-E and 426, we see over 80 million in 4E partnerships for schools of social work and probably more than 300 million when it comes to the training programs. Now, when I say training, I mean not just the social work education, which is more around 80 million. The training may involve the entire delivery of uh, pre-service training or in-service training for the state. So when you add that to the 4E that comes to colleges and universities, then you see a much more robust um, number. We know the early reprofessionalization supports the wonderful work that um, Anita Barbie did, that Bert did on MSWs and BSWs being the ones linked to higher rates of retention, higher salaries, better permanency, shorter length of stay, higher reunification. We also know competent supervision is a key retention uh, benefit. And some of the most um, recent work by the National Council on Crime and Delinquency looking at California counties found that the highest functioning counties with the best outcomes had the lowest turnover, the highest salaries, and no on-call duties because it's a gendered workforce. Many of the child welfare workers are women, and so they don't want to work evenings and weekends. They don't want to be pulled off their family duties. And so we see that when you want good outcomes, you need to have the best trained staff. I mean, not news to you, but the data are beginning to, to reinforce what you all know. So our agenda for partnerships needs to build off of the leadership skills around empowerment to be much more inclusive, not just with our public agencies, nonprofit agencies, but also with tribal systems. And you know, the, the, the fostering connections law makes it possible for our tribal communities, some of which I have had the privilege of working with in the state of Washington when we were able to sign the first tribal state agreement to build child welfare systems, parallel sovereign child welfare decision-making systems in our First Nation communities. So a piece of work that we all need to further advance. And we know that new relationships are needed at all levels around an empowerment and support agenda. The key roles for our field instructors, for faculty deans and directors, need to be nurtured all the more. We just recently, with deans and directors, have talked about the fact that many are new. They weren't part of the early 4E agreements that were forged in a mission-driven, uh, let's prevent child abuse and neglect deaths environment. And so they are not as up on some of the challenges of the 4E partnership, of really growing the workforce. How many of our schools of social work have workforce development in, in our mission statement? So workforce is still needing to be much more at the centerpiece of what deans and directors think about. And many of you as field instructors, as faculty, as agency leaders know that you've carried this almost as if it were on the margin rather than the centerpiece. 21st century means it needs to be the center of what we talk about. And it needs to go be beyond the 4E contract. It needs to be much more about organizational culture building work. The data are showing that just preparing a graduate with child welfare competencies is insufficient if the culture wrapped around them can't use their talents, perhaps is not the most um, enfranchising environment, and as a result, 4E becomes a gateway to social work rather than a gateway to a child welfare career. And so I think we need to work on the the organizational uh, development part of our 4E partnerships. And for me, that means, and I'm just, again, my Nikwi hat's off, that when there's a child death, when there's a high profile case, the very first thing I do is call a county exec or call a state agency director saying, I want to own responsibility for what happened. I want you to allow me to bring an external group together to help think through whether it's curriculum that we need to work on or whether it's community supports we need to work on 
or whether it's more data on what works and what doesn't, let me be part of the solution by offering a theory that I might be part of the problem. And just that hat in hand begins to set in motion a, an, a reframing of what is often, as you know, whenever there's a crisis, the kind of blame syndrome that stays within the agency and often um, hits the worker and supervisor. Externalizing that blame and owning it as a community development, a best practice development agenda is part of that culture building. It also means that even though we're seeing more disallowances, fewer children eligible for, for E, that, that we can't let up what this partnership agenda is because it, it's like Alvin's notion of relationship. When you're committed, you never abandon. You're always there. You always step up. You're there before anybody else calls or shows up. How can I help with this child death? Let me figure out how I'm part of the problem so that you don't have to bear this alone. Let me talk to the press rather than having your worker and supervisor vilified. So just, just that notion that we're never abandoning the centrality of the relationship is part of that reculturing. Now in the midst of that reculturing, we have a lot of work to do because you and I can, you know, wrap ourselves around these partnerships, but we have folks who are telling us internally and externally that our graduates can't use all their skills and the agency doesn't think the skills and the training we're providing are really relevant. So we've got this ongoing tension and even with the competency skills that we've developed around the country, many, how many of you have competency checklists for your schools, for your state? A number of you do. That many of those competency checklists aren't necessarily part of a national dialogue. That until we've taken your competency checklist and said, okay, how do we embrace them nationally? We will not be able to prove that what we're preparing our students to do are in fact, or is in fact, what the agency needs. So when we have a competency list that's developed, that's part of our training, that's part of our education, in context with our, our agency partners, that needs to now go national. And many of our partnerships are not only not competency driven, but they're not data informed. And again, that's all part of the 21st century agenda that the relevance of our training depends not just on how we bring about change in our universities and our tribal systems and our agencies, but also about who's at the table to build those changes. So for those of you who have, I'm going to use competency as an example, competency frameworks, if we were going to take those nationally and as a among us nationally, among our agencies, and all of our schools and programs of social work embrace those, we might at least have a common agenda to move forward on and say, you know, it's not just about social work education, but it's about these child welfare competencies that we're all agreeing to produce. And these are the relevant skills the agencies have said nationally they need. So there's a common floor, there's a common set of expectations, there's a common way that we assess for competencies, and then there's a common, if you will, gold standard that we've all worked toward. The beginning dialogue on competencies is being led by Gary Anderson at Michigan State. He's pulled together at least a few competency checklists, and those of you who've got them, hopefully afterward I can talk with you so we can make those part of this national dialogue. If we could all then move, from this competency frame to how do we ensure this gold standard common floor for all, that would go a long way at least in showing that we're serious about solving this gap, this twin gap, that we don't think our students are fully employed with all their skills and we don't think, as the agencies will tell us, that we're giving them the competencies that they really need a major issue not just for selection and employment, but also for retention. Now we know that part of our challenge is also related to what we do with our students. How many of our students are prepared for, um, for what used to be called 
uh, grassrooting change in a bureaucracy, supervising up, coming up with change projects that are win-win for all. How many of them know how to do logic models as a change agent or how to do implementation um, work using implementation science? These are all some of the attributes of our training through our NICWI um, Institute, but it's not in most of our curricula. How many of us are teaching adaptive leadership with HIFITS, getting on the balcony, getting outside of ourselves? Again, this is all part of what's pretty exciting with our institute, but I don't see it in our curricula. So a disconnect that we can easily fix. How many of us have coaches and mentors for our graduates? What we've heard from our supervisors and middle managers is that for them to be change agents in systems that might not be quite ready for all their changes to roll forward, they need to have national mentors. They need to have uh, coaches. They need to be part of a national practice community. They need to be able to be part of a learning system that's national. We could be doing the same thing with our graduates, having them be part of an ongoing mentoring system with coaches, using some of the technology that Sharon has developed with peer mentoring, peer coaches. This is all part of a retention strategy that we suspect may be critical to the future of our graduates. None of our systems can achieve outcomes in isolation, given the fact that most of our families are served by at least 14 other agencies. We know that we depend on all those other agencies to make or break our outcomes. That means that relations with other systems, using system of care principles, evidence-based practice must be inclusionary. It means then that when we think about workforce development, even though the 4E contracts may be for the public agency, we may do rotations for our students in nonprofit agencies. And I know a number of you are using rotations. So you may follow a family from the early call in the public agency and then have your student for three months in a nonprofit agency where they pick that case up and do intensive prevention or family preservation work. And then perhaps pick the case up in another agency where they're in residential treatment or foster care or um, fast track adoption if that's warranted. So the innovations in how we use our field placements align with innovations with the nonprofit sector, since increasingly the nonprofits are public sector agencies, given that they do the public sector work. It begs the question, then, of how much of our workforce development work has been exclusionary and needs to include them. I don't need to tell you how intriguing the PIPs are and how painfully challenging some of the child and family service reviews have been. If you just look at some of the reviews and some of the data um, that tell us about turnover, and then you just link that back to some of the other outcomes like length of stay or um, um, reunification barriers and, and, um, and even children who age out without sufficient mentoring and help, we begin to see that the collaboration we need in child welfare is bigger than just the nonprofits. It's also with the courts, it's with the schools, it's with the healthcare facilities. And the courts themselves are saying, how can we be part of the solution? Do we need to have youth courts? Do we need to be adopting some of these young people who are raising themselves in independent living as a judge? Should I be doing more as a judge to help some of these children and youth have a successful journey? Um, am I part of the problem by simply rubber stamping their independent living, absent sufficient family-like supports? Now, as we, as we think about this, this challenge of bringing everybody under this workforce roof, we get down to the question of how do we use those who are closest to the problem as solution makers for the future? And in a number of states, we've been testing design teams, design teams that may be with frontline workers, with supervisors, with families, with TANF workers, with uh, mental health, with substance abuse workers, with domestic violence workers, so that the changes are brought about through these design teams that are looking at problems, that are looking at barriers. 
In New York, we use design teams to deal with retention and high turnover. And what we found was when design teams picked members who were deputized by the work system, often frontline workers, some might have been very vocal about changes needed, a supervisor or two is deputized, an assistant um, or um, even higher level com a commissioner, him herself or herself, that when they're all at the table designing solutions and working on serving up what's needed next, we see not just a sense of empowerment, but they are the change makers. They are the game changers. And it's often the frontline staff. It may be frontline staff with families who are the game changers because they know what the barriers are, they know what the solutions are, they can supervise up, and as long as their norms to govern that, that, their, um, that their work is seen in win-win terms, not a threat to a commissioner, not a threat to the system, then they are not in harm's way, and we've seen remarkable county change. In one county, with very high rates of turnover, we went from high rates to no turnover, just through this empowerment design team model. We also adopt logic models where frontline staff learn how to design a logic model for change, where they do action research on their change projects, some basically overhauling how cases are assigned, who they're assigned to, the use of teams rather than lonely solo staffing. So we have evidence that these design teams not only improve retention, but change in many other systems as well. Alvin had been part of a number of design teams uh, in the Intermountain West where we saw some remarkable change, including change that was driven by parents themselves. Now part of our reculturing is not just about the building of a workforce in the context of excellent supports and empowerment, competency-driven, skills that are adequately tapped, but addressing trauma. And while there's some who believe that some of the trauma issues are overstated in child welfare, our data are suggesting that that's not the case. Both primary and secondary trauma should be an, a centerpiece of some of our university programs as well as our agency designs. And for our tribal communities, historical trauma is so profound and needs to be part of what it means to reculture those systems so that it's not just placing a new graduate in the absence of a recultured system and expecting a good outcome. It is definitely about the reculturing with a sanctuary model and also with protection. So if a, if a student who's now newly hired has a high profile case, what can that graduate be guaranteed? Can they be guaranteed that their name will not be in the press? Can they be guaranteed that their challenge will be reframed as a training issue, as a competency uh, issue that maybe the university and the, and the agency will own? Can it be reframed as an issue involving resources, or an issue involving caseload, or an issue involving the inability to predict um, certain relapses as youth, for instance, are being so medicated on multiple um, medications to deal with their behavioral health needs. So in, in the absence of guarantees as to how high profile cases will be handled, particularly when they're media induced trauma events, I think we heighten the contagion that otherwise could be managed in a much more gentle way in our agencies and across our universities, which again is why when there's a high profile case, I'm often the first one to call saying, let me own this, because I want, I want the onus off of the agency alone, off the worker, off the supervisor, and every time I've done that, I've been able to find a piece that implicates my university or some part of the external community beyond the university um, who might have been part of the problem. So a very, you know, this is terribly important in the reculturing. Also, part of the reculturing involves the quality of treatment. Over the years, I've had many students who've graduated, they're in the agency, and they say, you know, I feel like nobody has my back, and they're all talking about me. And they talk about one another. There's no high quality of treatment and interaction. So codes of civility were adopted by our design teams in some of our New York agencies. 
turning that culture around the same way we hear parents bad mouth in our agencies co-workers are bad mouth that's got to end and those of us in leadership roles need to be cops when it comes to managing a culture of high quality treatment the same is true in our interprofessional practice how often do we have that we they think thinking that you know, we're okay and those other agencies are the problem. They need to be part of that same high quality of treatment, as do parents need to feel that. And at the end of the day, our feedback on progress and our data as we're charting some of the cultural changes need to be troubleshooted through a, a, a continuous quality index because if we can't bring about change by charting progress and having data, we will not be able to come close to the retention that we seek. Now, it's not enough to say we've got competencies and skills, education that are aligned and matched a vision. We now have Commissioner Brian Samuels, um, ACF, saying to us, it's not enough for you to just be producing 4E programs, schools of social work, undergraduate and graduate programs, case managers for our system. Who's going to do the work of treating with clinically adept skills these youth, half of whom or more have mental health issues? So here is HHS Commissioner Brian Samuels saying to us, pilot new ways to use your graduates. Think about clinician practice using your graduates with these youth. Treat them. Treat them in your agencies. Treat them through clinics. Give them what they need to be successful and give your graduates clinical experiences so that being adept at assessment isn't the end of what it means for your graduate to use these very complex skills that they've been prepared to use. Let them go on and be the treatment agents as well. So it's a challenge. Just been offered to the deans and directors of schools of social work in the last two months from Commissioner Samuels. And it's one I bring to you today saying, what an intriguing idea that we saw this with our graduates um, doing family preservation work. We've seen them doing masterful work at family group conferencing. We've seen them doing masterful work and post-adoption success, much like family pr preservation. What would it be like if we went beyond just having that rigorous assessment to now having rigorous clinical treatment opportunities within our public agency? And adding to that, the evidence-based challenge that he brings to us that I bring and you know we live with daily. If we can't provide for our families what we know to work and what we know has evidence that's so gold standard oriented, then our highest need families are falling short of what they may need. So I'm very proud of the fact <clears throat> that within your partnerships a number of you are gathering data on what's working, not just on workforce development, but also on what's working with services, what's working with different modalities of parent training, what's working to ensure that youth have a much more successful journey as they move into independent living and beyond. So we've talked about the new configurations, we've talked about trauma, we've talked about workforce studies to chart progress, and now we're at a point where we need to move to our field units to be incubators, much like the model that we see in medicine, but it's very different for us in child welfare, where the, the teaching hospitals are places where the faculty member and the, the, doc, the, the, the young physicians in residence all learn together, and they're testing new models of service delivery and outcomes. Our field units could be the incubators of the very same intensive testing, much like Commissioner Samuels would like to see with more clinical treatment for high need youth. There is no reason why our field placements, if they're not already, um, 
aren't the incubators for the evidence-based developmental um, uh, initiatives around best practices and research, translational research, as well as inventing new practices. I was at a meeting with MSW supervisors in New York City. They were newly minted graduates of a 4E program. They were all supervisors. And a group like this, they all had research studies they wanted to do on their theory of what was working and for whom. And they challenged us as deans and directors in the state. They said, if you can't fund us to do this, then we're going to feel underemployed because we are inventing pioneering solutions to the needs of many of these high-need families. And there's nobody behind us to bring and wrap around us the research, the money, the studies that would tell us whether or not what we're doing really works. That challenge to this day is one that echoes for me across the country. How do we wrap around our supervisors who are leading, in many cases, incubating in their work units some of the most innovative practices that just leave us, unfortunately, disconnected from them? So I challenge us to go beyond the notion that we all have to do this and do it just through the 4E model. because. Many of us and our agencies and our workers are sitting on resources that right now are using dollars that may not be the best route. Um, I've had many a former student come to me saying, you know, I'm really struggling. I'm not having success. And I'm saying, well, how much, how much money are you spending for every youth you put into a, a very intensive clinicalized, if not medicalized, environment? And I'd find that they'd be spending $100,000 per youth, and I'd say, you are so rich. If I could just take that $500,000 that, that you've already spent for these five youth and help you work on your dream, you're spending the money anyway, let's roll out a pilot that could test some alternatives so that we pay now or we pay later. So teaching them how to move that money from a deep end, less desirable outcome to a much more front end innovation. Again, our child welfare systems encumber money as we have for years in foster care, residential treatment and elsewhere, where we don't have to spend it all at the deep end. We know that we've got theories, priorities and solutions that could move those dollars up. And the ones who want us to do that are our graduates. So these service pilots could be part of the reculturing of partnerships. The other thing to remember, and Jill Kinney from Home Builders taught us years ago, it's not just about the MSW or the BSW, that 50% of what she thought the MSW and BSW could do is now being done by neighbors, 24-7 neighbors, who know when mom's going to relapse, who know when that boyfriend is returning, who may threaten the livelihood of that mom threaten the well-being of that child. They are the ones who may know when Parents Anonymous or Narcotics Anonymous needs to move to their neighborhood or their tribe. They are the ones who know when a mentor family is needed to adopt another family and help them before they re-enter the system. They are the ones who might be the advocates to ensure that in family conferencing that everybody and every voice is heard equally. They are the ones who even can guide our dual track systems to be sure that we've got the indigenous knowledge coming from our communities. So it's not enough to bring just our neighbors, our parents, our community groups in and leave our systems with high rates of entry. While the Children's Bureau, while HHS, while Casey, NE Casey, celebrates the reduction in cases coming into the system in the last 13 years, the challenge for us is now to reduce them by another 25%. We could do that. And our students, our field units, our dual track strategies, our prevention initiatives, our reculturing, our early intervention, our school-based services could all be part of that solution. Families shouldn't have to suffer or maim those they love in order to get help. When we can see those risk factors early on, when we now have the flexibility to meet those needs early on. 
And much of that early on work tells us that the disproportionality challenges that govern, if not overtake us, with chagrin, if not profound humility, are also about our families of color not accessing those needs-based prevention and early intervention care systems. So they're forced into our systems, forced into the deep end. So much of this is about simultaneously bringing our services to the front end to those families who disproportionately, because of uh, race, ethnicity, penetrate our systems. At the end of the day, the systems of care principles that I promised we'd link back to govern how we think about moving forward. This is about interagency collaboration with a workforce engine, individualized strength-based care systems, core competencies across our systems, not just public child welfare, the nonprofits. What good is it if an addiction worker doesn't have a family-centered approach and doesn't understand why we reframed an issue as a family-centered issue? These other professionals interprofessionally need to be the gatekeepers for the same good outcomes that you and I are fostering. We need to care about cultural competence and humility across our systems of care not just being family and youth guided, but driven, opening up career pathways for parents and for youth with accountability and workforce improvements, thinking about new roles for parents. How many of us are able to say to a parent, once they've successfully gone through parent training, once they've successfully overcome some of their challenges, there's a path for you here as a case aid to help another parent. For our youth, there's a path here for you to go on and be a youth advocate for other youth. For foster parents, there's a path here for you into social work. These paraprofessional pathways and educational and career supports are essential. And we, oh, I've already heard President Flores talk about how our colleges and universities have foster children in them. How many of our students are former foster kids? How many of us even ask the question, at the admissions level when they come into our universities and colleges as freshmen, maybe not even into our programs. I say to my university, I want every foster, former foster child or current foster child who's applying to my university to, I want to know who they are. I want you to ask that question so I can find them, so I can figure out what the, the career supports would be for them so they don't flounder. So owning these pathways for parents, for youth, for foster parents, for adoptive parents is part of workforce. It's not just us as MSWs, BSWs alone. It's ensuring that the red carpet is there because we've got to be doing succession planning. We've got to build and grow our workforce future. We've got to foster these pathways and ensure that what we do now becomes a mile marker for the future of our workforce. Many of us are seeing the graying of our workforce, pipeline issues that are, that are a challenge, and we have a natural pipeline, and many of those pipeline uh, members are former successful clients. So how do we celebrate the Children's Bureau Centennial? I think workforce is the centerpiece. I think our workforce studies that you'll hear more about in the next couple of days that are cross-system, again, Texas, um, Georgia, California are extraordinary examples, New York as well. These are cross-system studies. They're across the state. They're robust. To me, that's a mile marker. How do we also test with our workforce studies what the differential outcome is for children and families? the 4E students versus the non-4E students who are MSWs and BSWs, the configurations, MSWs and baccalaureate students in adoptions, in foster care, in prevention work. How do we also attend to the cross-systems workforce and outcome issues and pipelines? Because at the end of the day, if our workforce studies are limited solely to the public agency and to how our graduates fare, and we've left out the nonprofits and the tribal agencies, if we've left out what happens to our youth, and we've left out what happens in all the systems that touch them and their families, 
substance abuse, welfare, mental health, disabilities, we are leaving out the very workers who, in this century, we will, in the future, have at conferences like this because they will be seen as part of the child welfare workforce. They do the work for us now. They often make or break the outcome of a case. And until they're part of how we collect our data and how we build those collective pipelines, so maybe some of our parents and youth don't work for us. They may work for a, 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 a nonprofit agency or for the local um, educational program, the, the, the high school that's needing more youth advocates. But until we've attended to all the institutions who touch the lives of our child welfare public sector families, we will not have solved the workforce crisis, nor will we have solved the outcomes that still challenge us so that we will have a day to look forward to where every child welfare public sector family has a red carpet of evidence-based, treatment-rich supports and exceptional outcomes, and where we can celebrate that indeed the centennial, the 100 years that have gotten us to today, now moves forward with another century of exceptional milestones. And maybe 100 years from now, we'll come back to this wonderful august setting and be able to celebrate that we have made some of those milestone goals the achievements of another 100 years. But let's do it in 10 or 20. Thank you. Thank you very much. You never disappoint. <laughs> We're so glad you flew in at midnight last night to join us from California. I just wanted to say a few words real quick. I wanted to be sure and recognize uh, two partners in crime, uh, Patrick Leong and Joe Papik from the University of Houston Central University that have been very helpful in 